Hello and welcome to Raj Sabha Television. I am Akhilesh Suman and you are watching Indian Standard Time. Indian Standard Time is a window of Raj Sabha Television where we talk with foreign dignitaries who are of eminence. And with me today is Lord Dollar Popat. Lord Dollar Popat is one of the economic envoys of British Prime Minister Theresa May and he has been ex-minister in David Cameron's cabinet. Dollar Popat, Lord. Welcome, Raj Sama Television. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Uh, sir, Commonwealth Summit just has happened. And what do you think that, is there any change expected in the Commonwealth Summit? I think huge, but if I just correct you, I'm not advisor to the Prime Minister. I'm Prime Minister's trade envoy. Okay, envoy. And obviously, Commonwealth is just not a network anymore that it used to be for many years. Uh, it is a lot more than the network. In fact, it's a family of 53 nations. Right. And, um, this summit was very much not just a meeting of heads of state, but it was very much an outreach to businesses, to minds and souls of people, to celebrate the diverse culture, that history we share together. Okay. But uh, this time, when uh, Prince of Wales, Charles, has been nominated in a way by Queen Elizabeth, what change do you see uh, in the future of Commonwealth? I think the Commonwealth started by Her Majesty's father and she carried on and this time has come for her to step down. She has suggested that Prince Charles take over and I think there are about 29 countries out of 53 who are happy if Prince Charles takes that uh, carries on with the Commonwealth. But then Commonwealth needs to be reformed as well now. Okay. We need more outreach than just, um, uh, you know, uh, 53 member states. Okay. But Commonwealth needs to reform, that's right. But uh, you know that this time, the 25th Commonwealth Summit was considered to be a bit different. Uh, it was uh, being projected as a bit different Commonwealth Summit than earlier ones. What was the difference that you are seeing uh, in this Commonwealth Summit? I think there's a, there's a change of mindset from our side. But to an extent by India as well. When India joined Commonwealth, when Jawaharlal Nehru joined Commonwealth yeah. after independence, people were surprised because Jawaharlal Nehru was very much against imperial power. Okay. And uh, to join Commonwealth was something that came as a shock to India. But Nehru was very much an outward-looking prime minister. So is your current prime minister, Narendra Modi. He is very much outward-looking prime minister. He's traveled to many, many countries. Okay. And he wants to see Commonwealth as a global organization. So do we. So after Prince Charles becomes, uh, in a way, head of the uh, Commonwealth, how uh, change do you see that? How he will be different than Queen Elizabeth? I think it's, it, it's more directed by the members. The members of the country now realize that one way to enhance Commonwealth, although we have education, we have, uh, you know, culture and, and diversity there. But the commonality we have with these 53 countries in terms of English language, judiciary, rule of law, all that is very helpful. But one way to get people out of poverty in some of these poor African countries okay. and poor Commonwealth countries okay. is through trade and investment. Okay. But uh, some people were telling that uh, Commonwealth needs to be developed like a trade block, something on the lines of ASEAN or any other trade block, uh, just not networking. So how do you think it is future? I think if you look at Commonwealth, Commonwealth has got one third of the world population. Hmm. Okay, eight Commonwealth countries out of ten has got the highest growth, economic growth. Yet there are many Commonwealth countries that suffer from poor <laughs> governance and poverty. Mm -hmm. So I think trade is one way of okay. getting people of Commonwealth countries okay. out of poverty. So is there any effort to make it, a, develop it like a trade block? Yes, this is why this particular summit was important. It was, as I said, an outreach to businesses. We had a number of business forums, we had a number of business ministers who spoke. Uh, I hosted the business, the Confederation of British Industries and Indian Industries in Parliament myself okay. to make aware for us to work together, to trade together. Okay. Trade cements the relationship, even the political relationship, quite often trade cements it so well. Okay. But uh, given the fact that uh, uh, Commonwealth is coming at a time, this Commonwealth is coming at a time when Britain is out of BRICS, out of European Union. So how do you see that Commonwealth is going to help Britain in its own economic uh, resurgence? 
I think Britain and India being the largest Commonwealth country can reshape Commonwealth into a global trading nation. On the European Union, the 27 member states with half a million population, we are obviously now leaving EU by March next year. And in many ways, our, our relation was so important that it will be more outreach in them okay. than the European Union. Yeah, but, but, but given the fact that now European Union and you, means Britain, are deciding about how they will divorce each other, in this situation, when you are trying to go close to India, will it help? Will it of help Britain? Of course, with help Britain. We have historic relations with India. We have some 15 billion pound trade with India. India with 1.3 billion customers. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge Indian <coughs> diaspora here, 1.7 million people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the commonality of English language, rule of law, right. democracy, institutions. Right. In fact, you know, it's cheaper for us by 19% okay. to trade with India than to trade with one of the European Union countries. But is it also a fact uh, that uh, Britain doesn't want India to Indians to immigrate in Britain now? Is it a sense is going in India that Britain is somehow lukewarm to immigration from India? Well, that's not true. We have 1.7 million of Indian diaspora living in 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 UK. We have large Indian investment in UK. Uh, you know, uh, direct investment coming to UK and vice versa. It's not that our immigration policy is firm but fair. So we can't just an open door immigration policy. We've got to be selective. And um, after leaving the European Union, we will obviously be very selective who we take and where we take from. So where does India stand in this election? India is in a very good position. India has got one of the most highly skilled people, highly educated people. And there are people that uh, we need for our own economy. So we will get them on work permit. We continue doing that anywhere. We haven't stopped work permit people coming to work here. What we've done, we have got to toughen on students coming to bogus universities here. Our schools and universities are open for students as long as they're genuine. But, but if you see the data, last year in 2017, 88,000 Chinese students came here and only 17,000 Indian students came here. So it looks big gap between India and China. So is, uh, even being the Commonwealth country, is Britain uh, giving importance to China than India in this situation also? Not at all. The criteria by universities and schools and colleges of taking students from abroad are the same, whether it's Chinese, a Turk, or even Indian. <coughs> even the visa criteria are the same. It's just Chinese have realized how important is English language? English language is a, is a trading language. Yeah. China is a, a trading nation, uh, second largest economy in the world. Yeah. So I think they realize that um, we need to teach our students English. So, so, so what is the result? The result is that Indians are inc decreasing and Chinese are increasing. No. Ch Chinese have more or less, is going at a faster rate. More Chinese now now coming than ever before. And Indians, in terms of numbers, are more or less stable. You know, what happened is that we had a big inflow of Indian students coming in in the 90s and early 2000s because of those bogus colleges taking these Indian students into this country when they're not genuine students. That means uh, Chinese students are not coming in the bogus colleges? Not at all. Now, we have closed down all the bogus. So all uh, universities are now assigned with the Home Office to, you know, are, are actually are approved universities for giving visas. But uh, uh, Lord Popert, you had been one of the closest person, and you had been one I came to know that uh, who had motivated UK to go closer to India and also closer to Narendra Modi. You told them that uh, yes, Narendra Modi can be the future Prime Minister. But given still, uh, I think there is some sort of. Uh, lack of understanding between the two countries when Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister and Theresa May is the Prime Minister here? Not at all. What, what I did when I was the, uh, a minister, I campaigned with her foreign office to engage with Narendra Modi when he was um, Chief Minister of Gujarat. And <coughs> our High Commissioner, uh, James Bevan, went to see Narendra Modi, Modi. On a second trip, I joined James Bevan yeah. for uh, engagement but not endorsement okay. when he was a chief minister. And then our minister for foreign affairs, Hugo Swire, went to see Narendra Modi to endorse him as someone that we will work with, we will do business with. 
So now Narendra Modi has completed four years almost, and I see that there is a new energy between India and UK in this point of time. So how if, if uh, how do you see that India UK trade political relations? How you see going now? Wow, it's just booming. Okay. It's booming like nobody's business. You can see the excitement. Mm -hmm. You can see the warm uh, reception Modi received. When he last came here, he addressed 80,000 people. Even David Cameron, the Prime Minister, then spoke in Gujarati. His okay. wife was in a sari. Okay. <coughs> no other Prime Minister has received a reception that Modi has received in UK by our Prime Minister. And this time, of course, Prince Charles was with him at the High at Science Stadium. Prime Minister Modi met Her Majesty the Queen. So I think it's an exciting time for two great countries. There's a real patriotism by even British Indians here living here. Okay. Remember, half the Indians living here are born here. So the connection with India is literally nothing. But now it's somehow, it's, you know, Modi has brought that excitement for us. But uh, tell me, Lord, when you are in UK, you are a citizen of UK, and when you saw lots of love and bonhomie for India, does it create some sort of uh, misunderstanding with the UK establishment? Not at all. Like uh, any two, any two families will always have some challenges and misunderstanding. They sit down, discuss, debate, and sort it out. And very similar, we have with India. If there's anything that we are not happy with or they're not happy with, talk and discuss, and we come to a very amicable solution. But uh, Modi is um, remember that he is just not your prime minister. Yeah, he's a world statesman. Okay. And he has been to so many countries now. So right. Modi has really given the profile of India much higher than what the British people had before Modi came to power. Oh, so now when Prime Minister Narendra Modi is there in his seat, what more he should do so that trade between UK and India increases? I think India has really a lot of work to do, a lot of challenges. Firstly, India's infrastructure okay. is extremely poor. Okay. If you look at your roads, if you look at your ports, I was in your Bombay port last right. week. Right. Now, that port is not capable of taking a further 5% export, you know. Uh -huh. So, it, you need to build the infrastructure right. But look at your world ranking of ease of doing business. Okay. You're, you were ranked 131 before Modi came. Okay. Now you are ranked 101 okay. and still pretty, you know, you need to get it down to under 50. Even country like Rwanda, for example, poor African countries ranked 41. Okay. So ease of doing business is crucial. That is a key thing for British companies to come to India. So why it is not happening? You know India much better than many in the UK. Well, I remember that you were ranked 131, now 101, so you improved by 30, but then you've got a long way to go. And I think you need to make huge infrastructure investment. And that's why we opened up Masala Bond to raise money in UK. You raised four billion on Masala Bond here in, from London. It's the largest financial center of the world. Okay. Uh, you really need to borrow money, maybe, and, and get your infrastructure right, and quickly. So do you think that UK can help India create infrastructure in a better way? Absolutely, we can, yes. We have the, you know, we have good companies who are good at infrastructure okay. projects, but India itself has got many good companies. I know, you know. So, but had any talk uh, between the two countries about the infrastructure development? I think it took, took place when David Cameron was the Prime Minister of Narendra Modi. That we were happy to help you. Okay. Uh, the, David Cameron took Narendra Modi on a uh, London Bridge and all that. So, so the rivers, how we can help to clean those, um, your Ganga and all that. So, and we are happy. Uh, Chance to Osborne at the time was obviously came up with this one way of raising money through. London and yeah. by issuing masala bonds. Okay, but uh, once uh, you know that uh, there is a situation when you are out of uh, European Union and India is also trying to emerge as an economic, uh, uh, you know, that powerhouse in the world. So how can UK help India in that? Well, India is already the seventh largest economy. Yeah. Same as us, more yeah. or less. We are in Yeah. So we can both help each other. There's no doubt about that. Okay. One good thing you have, you have a very highly educated, skilled people there. You know, and you have very good companies there. Like, and they're all successful. Uh, <coughs> Jaguar Land Rover is a good example. Vedanta is another good example. Quoted on London Stock Exchange is a FTSE 100 company headed by Anil Agarwal. So you have good, you have very able management team. I met 40 of your top executives of Indian companies. I hosted them in Parliament. 
Okay. And I was horribly impressed with their personality, with the character, with the vision, with the ability. So you have a lot, lot, lot in there to make India rise and rise, and it's rising anywhere. But still, something is missing in India, that uh, whoever goes to India, whoever, for even foreign dignitaries tell that there is some problem in India that is not growing faster as it could have. So what, according to you, is the major problem that okay, India For is? the size of your economy and the, for the size of your population, nearly 1.3 billion customers, yes, you should do a lot better than you're doing now. Yeah. Infrastructure is one area, bureaucracy, okay. red tapes, okay. corruption to an extent as well. Okay. All this need to be eradicated to make it easier, better, safer. What is in common between us? We are all trading nations. English language in common. We are family of nations in the Commonwealth. When you are talking about red tape, the India has inherited the whole bureaucratic political structure from Britain. If there is no red tape in Britain, how it is in India? What is the issue? I think we, it's, it's nearly 70 years since you got independence. You are a young democracy. We are 800 years old. Okay. So if, if you inherited any red tape of bureaucracy from us at the time, you had 70 years to sort it out and rectify it. You know. And that's where the rule of law in parliament comes into it, that you can make changes. You can bring about changes that will help companies. But do you think that red tapeism is going down in India or it is uh, stagnant or it is increasing? From what I know and speaking to some of the business people, uh, it is getting better but not to the extent they want it. What should Narendra Modi do for Speed that? up the process. You know, if your application for planning or anything comes, let's, like, let's do it quickly, let's get on with it, you know. You don't need to wait for a long time. A lot of things have happened, you know, in your... When I, for example, if you want to send money abroad, pay for goods and services, your banks are very good in the speed of the process. Right. So, you are a member of House of Lords. There is a Raj Sabha in India parallel to that. Yeah. This whole session had washed out. This budget session has washed out. Yeah. You must be knowing. So, what is the system here? Do, does it happen in the House of Lords also like this? It never happens. Never. There's a real discipline, there's respect for the Speaker. The Speaker is a final person in the Commons, and the Lord is a whip. Okay. And I'm a whip in the House of Lords oh, at the yeah. moment. Okay. So people respect what we say, and uh, there is a real discipline. And, um, you know, we may have different, split, different political ideology with our opposition, but we are friends. We mean well for the country. We are there to rebuild the country, and, and I think what's important is. is the country's interest is more important than your personal agenda. The VP in the House of Lords is like a chairman of uh, Rajya Sabha? No, I've been since no, 2010. I, I was a government whip and I was Minister of the Crown for business and then transport. And I also worked for Her Majesty the Queen. I was Lord in Waiting. And now I'm a party whip. So okay. I'm one of the eight party whips that, uh, in, the, in the Lord. Yeah, yeah. You are uh, with the ruling party. Correct, yeah. But opposition party, the Labour Party. And there had been so many things, you, uh, you attacked Syria, then recently chemical weapons, against chemical weapons, and also uh, there are issues. So how does opposition behave here in the House of Lords? I think they're very reasonable. Yeah. As, long as, as long as we've done in the interest of our country, and as long as we've done in the interest of the people, I mean, Syria, using chemical weapons, something not acceptable uh, by, you know, world order. And it's important that if anybody right. uses capital But Labour has it is dented. Labour has told that you should have discussed it first in the House. Yeah, but under the international laws, it was necessary. If that was the case, that we should have brought this as a debate in the Parliament, Labour raised this issue, but they didn't go any further than that. But, but tell me, Lord, how can you be the custodian of what is happening in Syria? If Syria is having internal problems, its own internal problems, how is Britain responsible and how is Britain uh, taking a stand and then sending uh, missiles there? Well, we, we have a responsibility to our fellow human beings no matter where they're living. You know, <coughs> Britain is a very compassionate country. <coughs> we don't attack countries with a view to kill their people. We attack countries to make sure that, that they behave well and with international standards. What's the purpose of having international standards, international laws and all that, if they don't abide by it? But you did the same uh, in Iraq, yes. in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, a, in with the uh, USA, and you did the same in Syria. But do you keep any window open for Syrians to talk to you, or you just go and bomb? 
Oh no, we are very, we are very diplomatic country, as you know. We try and talk, discuss, debate, and try and find solutions. We support them where we can, and if they don't, then come up with, you know, if they're treating their own people so badly, Turks. I mean, sorry, Iraqis killed a large number of Kurds as well, and Saddam was nothing but a dictator, and he wasn't following the world order. The world order is crucial. You, you, India is, you know, scores so many marks in that area, 100 out of 100 when it comes to world order. You've got institution in place, you've got rule of law, you've got democracy, you hold your government to account, you have regular elections, you know. It's a people's country for the people, by the people. But in Iraq, you burned your hand. You would later realize that uh, there was no weapon of mass destruction. Even Tony Blair uh, told that intelligence was... Well, we were led to believe at the time. Yeah. Then we carried out extensive inquiry. Iraq inquiry lasted some eight, ten months. Yeah. And we obviously looked at where we went wrong. And we want to make sure we make, don't make the same mistakes again. So that is why you took precaution this time that you will not... You will just do the targeted bombing? Exactly. In Syria. So, when you see from London, when you see the world from London, and when you sit in the Commonwealth, what is the main agenda about Commonwealth? What, what, how do you want to shape Commonwealth? I think Commonwealth is, we want to shape Commonwealth of the 21st century. And India has a crucial role to bear. India is a, the biggest member, the largest member of the Commonwealth. Yeah. And we want Commonwealth more than just a network of people. We want more than you know, heads of state getting together. We want to right. see <coughs> exchange of culture, education. Mm. But most important, we want to take Commonwealth to another level by business engagement. And that's where we see prosperity for Commonwealth for the future. It's not just we want to give aid, but also we want to trade now. But uh, one of the Commonwealth countries, yeah. that is uh, Pakistan, I will name it. Pakistan is in SARC. And Sark has uh, been in a very bad shape because of uh, their own uh, behavior in the Sark. And the Sark summit is not taking place because uh, Pakistan is giving uh, support to terrorism in India and in other uh, countries of Sark also. Afghanistan, to name another one. Again, Pakistan is present in the Commonwealth. So don't you think that with this country in the same group, Commonwealth also will become a redundant? I think one of the problems you have and we have is that we have faced terrorism last 50 years now. Yeah. And terrorism have come from many different sources. In yeah. UK, we have seen the number of terrorist attacks has taken place. Yeah. And not far from here, a policeman was killed just about four months ago. So yes, it's a major concern. When it comes to Pakistan, of course, by being in the Commonwealth, we can, they are Commonwealth Charter. And they know they're going to comply with the Commonwealth Charter. If they don't, they can be removed from Commonwealth. And Pakistan has been removed in the past and rejoined again. I know, yeah. And of course, if you see what Americans have done, they stopped giving aid. We have reduced our aid. And by, by being in the Commonwealth, you can regularly engage with them and talk to them and educate and explain. Rather than being outside and shouting at them, it's best to be in the system and talk to them. So you want to persuade Pakistan to right. behave properly, that is what you mean? That's right. And we're continuously doing that. We regularly remind Pakistan of issues that, uh, uh, you know, that we face here and issues that they need to address. And, uh, one thing that uh, Pakistan is very close to China also. Yeah. When Prime Minister Theresa May was addressing, she was beginning, she said that uh, there should be international rule, international order. She was, she might be hinting, I asked the question to her, she might be his, asking about the situation in Asia, Pacific, South China Sea. So how do you see from here about South China Sea? She was I very think, good. I think you made a very good point there. International order is crucial. Yeah. That international order was literally through Magna Carta, born in this country, went to America, went to the whole of Europe, <coughs> and international orders are being followed by literally two-thirds of the world. One third who doesn't like, country like Iraq and Syria and all that, is where we are there. We're yeah. telling, you see, if they don't meet international standards, we won't buy their goods even. Yeah. Okay? So they're being punished by not following international. They realize they need to follow international order and be accountable to international courts as well. What about China, South China Sea? Yes, that is another area. This is why, you see, Sadly, the making of China is us, when I say Europe and America. No. China is so rich. Okay. 
is we buy the goods. We buy, for example, 60 billion pounds worth of goods from China. Yeah. That's literally four times more than we buy from India. And I think we have realized, Trump administration has realized, that unless China follows certain international orders, no. we will not trade with them as we used to do in the past. So do you think that the way Trump is uh, uh, trying to motivate or behave with China to stop duplicating the technology? To stop? I think Trump's policy on China is, is hit on, well, that's fantastic. Yes, he's right. So uh, do you think that Britain will also follow suit? In many ways, we do. You're doing? Yeah. You're doing? Not doing it. We will do. You will do? Yeah. We will also raise the same issue that Americans have done. OK. So, so when it comes to this type of situation, when both of you are in World Trade Organization, can it be solved at the, that level, World Trade Organization? It can be. But let me say, why, why in the last 50 years, of, not 50, 30 years, we've been buying goods from China? Why did India not do the same, did not supply? Indians have got same population, same ability as Chinese have. India could be a great exporter, not China. So that's and very... you need to sort yourselves out, really. We ideally buy from you because you follow world order, because you're a free country, you're democratic, and we have that specially historic link with you, politically, socially, culturally, and economically. So we are coming to the end of an interview. Sure. So what you should uh, say that uh, what India should do so that we can, uh, you can buy from India? You, you can manufacture Well, I think, also? for example, we, we buy 30 million shirts a year, hmm. uh, large corp. So meet them, talk to the chief exec. Listen, we will produce this. You buy from China, we can give you value for money, same product at the same price. But you help us to set up the factories here. You train our people and buy from us. You can do that. It's not difficult. You but need that approach. But can uh, Britain help in that? Absolutely. In Why not? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we inward investment from you, or outward investment to India is something we, Cameron and Theresa May has been doing it, wanting to do for a long time. But and so did Modi. So what is the problem? Modi told, Prime Minister Modi told that make in India. Yeah. What, what, what do you think that, what is the problem that you are not making in India? I want an honest reply. Well, you, now I want you to make it in India and sell it to us. We ideally buy from you than the Chinese. Okay. If you can produce the same quality of goods, you can't beat China on quality and price. You can, if you do the same, yes, we will buy from you. It doesn't matter. So my last question, sir, yeah. I'm going to India, and what do you think that Prime Minister Nand Modi should do the next day about making India, manufacturing India? If you have to tell one point, that Prime Minister should do. He must create industrial parks with manufacturing ability of, say, 50 items that the Western world buys from, say, China, and set those factories up, support them, give them bank loan guarantee schemes, all that, make it available to them, give them the land to build those industrial parks. In order to develop new towns, new industrial parks, and really move on and take it uh, where China is. So. Uh, Lord Dollar Popert is telling that Britain will be inclined to buy from India the way it buys from China. But the question is whether Indian bureaucratic system and whether the Indian policy making system will do it, it will be interesting to see. Akhilesh Suman for Rajasabha Television with camera person Srivi Sudarshan in London.